be seated. I welcome you to uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 16, the very last chapter in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 16, and uh, I will speak uh, from verses 1 to verse 8. But to begin, we'll read uh, just uh, verses 1 to 5. So Mark chapter 16, and beginning to read it, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Father God, we thank you for this account of Scripture. We thank you for this account of the resurrection of our Savior, Christ Jesus. We thank you for this account of the most momentous occasion in history, the uh, decisive uh, point in which, uh, Lord, uh, you defeated death for humankind, and you uh, did it through your Son, uh, Christ Jesus. And I pray that uh, as we recall this event and uh, these uh, words of Scripture, that, uh, Lord, you will assure us of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior uh, so that we might be confident about his resurrection and expectant and hopeful and assured about our own resurrection from the dead too. So Father, I pray you will speak this way to us this morning through these words of scripture. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. In Jerusalem, Within the walls of the so-called Old City, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands upon the site Christians have long revered as the place where Jesus was buried and then rose from the dead. From October 2016 to March 2017, National Geographic archaeologists and engineers investigated and restored the edicule, or shrine, that houses the revered burial site. And what they discovered then has confirmed much of traditional Christian understanding. The Holy Sepulchre Church itself dates from the Crusader era and was dedicated in the year 1149. But the present church was a restoration of the more ancient structure built in the 4th century by the Roman Emperor Constantine and his devoutly Christian mother, Helena. And forensic testing of a marble slab beneath the edicule has dated the mortar on it to about 345 A.D. But even deeper within the burial shrine lies further confirmation about its past. Technicians use ground penetrating radar and other tools to peer behind the retaining walls beneath the edicule. And with their technology, the investigators saw earlier walls and pieces of a tomb hewn from the bedrock limestone. All this serves to confirm what Christians have understood for 2,000 years, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the site of the empty tomb of Jesus. 
Here in Mark chapter 16, we have the account about the original discovery that the grave of Jesus was empty. And the supernatural revelation to his disciples that their master is risen from the dead. According to verse 1 of this account, early Sunday morning, some women who have been devoted followers of Jesus come to his tomb to honor his body. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger disciple named James, and Salome, the mother of James the older, and John, have accompanied the master throughout Galilee and have supported the, his ministry and cared for his practical needs. These women have also witnessed the death and burial of their beloved master. As he has cried out and drawn his last breath on the cross, in chapter 15, verse 40, these women have been watching from a distance. Joseph of Arimathea, a sympathetic member of the Jewish ruling council, has come and wrapped the body of Jesus in linen and carried it to a tomb cut out of rock. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary have followed and watched the nobleman lay the body of their master in the tomb and then roll a stone against the entrance. The crucifixion and death of Jesus have occurred on a Friday and the day before the Jewish Sabbath, which is the sacred day of rest. According to Jewish reckoning, the Sabbath begins at sunset on Friday. Throughout the whole day, Jews are very careful not to do any work. So the grieving women refrain from visiting the tomb to anoint the body of their slain master until the Sabbath has ended. Then, as verse 2 recounts, Sunday morning arrives. The women rise early and set out for the tomb outside the city. And they arrive just after the sun has risen. Literally, the Greek text reads, they come upon the tomb, the rising of the sun. And with these words, the account implies that another sort of rising has occurred. In their sorrow over what has happened to Jesus and their urgency to honor his body, the women have forgotten about the heavy gravestone. But now as they approach the tomb, in verse 3, they think about the rock and wonder how they will move it from the entrance. The stone is an enormous dish-shaped boulder that rolls in a slope channel which has been chiseled out of the bedrock in front of the entrance to the tomb. Rolling the stone into place has been relatively easy, but moving it away again will take the strength of several men. And where, the women wonder to themselves, will they find men willing to help them with the task? But in verse 4, when Mary Magdalene and the other two women arrive, they are surprised to find the tombstone has already been rolled away. The sight of the open tomb seems strange to the women, but they are anxious to see the body of their master and they enter the tomb apprehensively. There, according to verse five, inside the dimly lit cavern, sitting on the carved rock bench of the chamber and brightly clothed in a white robe is a young man. His youthful appearance suggests vitality and life, and his white garment is like the clothing the sacred Jewish scriptures record heavenly beings have appeared in. At the sight of this white-clothed young man, the women are alarmed the text says, because they do not know who he is and why he is sitting there in the tomb. 
The women first suppose that the Jewish elders or the Roman authorities have placed the man here and that he may arrest them for being disciples of Jesus. But from the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that the young man within the tomb is really an angel of the Lord. Don't be alarmed. The heavenly messenger quickly tells the women when they come into the tomb and find him there, as we read in verse 6. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. With these words, the angel reveals to the women that he well knows whom they have come to see. But they should not be looking for him here in the tomb and among the dead bodies of this burial place. So the angel now announces to the women about their crucified master, he has risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him? This is an astonishing and incredible announcement. And the women scarcely comprehend it, let alone believe it. Jesus has spoken often to his followers about his death and about his resurrection afterward, but Mary and the other women are still not prepared for the revelation that the words of Jesus have now been fulfilled and that he truly has risen from the dead. They naturally wonder where the body of their master is because only two days ago they have been here and have seen Joseph of Arimathea lay the lifeless body of Jesus in the tomb. But go, the angel instructs the women in verse 7, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. The women should not remain any longer at the empty tomb, and neither should they continue to search for the body of Jesus. Rather, they should return to the disciples, including Peter, who has three times disowned the master and been overwhelmed with regret, and remind them about his instructions to meet him in their Galilean homeland. Trembling and bewildered, verse 8 recounts finally, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the woman named Salome are all frightened and confused by what they have just seen and heard. They still suppose that Jesus is dead and that the authorities have taken his body away somewhere for safekeeping from his disciples. The women worry that the Jewish rulers will come after them and arrest them because they have been followers of the convicted and crucified rebel Jesus. From the verses that follow here in Mark and the other Gospels, we know the women who have, been at, uh, who have been to the tomb will soon decide to return to the disciples and tell them it is empty. Later the same morning when Mary Magdalene will return to the burial site, Jesus himself will appear to her alone and speak her name. And she will suddenly recognize him as her dear master. I have seen the Lord. The Magdalene will go and announce to the disciples of Jesus, and with those words, Mary will share with them the Yangelion, the gospel, or the happy good news about the resurrected and living Savior. The empty tomb of Jesus of Nazareth. The testimony of the women who found the body of their master missing. 
And the unexpected announcement by the white-clad young man that Jesus had risen. All these things from the gospel account demand explanation. And the best answer is that Christ indeed has risen. What about the witnesses? Can we trust their testimony? Or should we suspect their story has been contrived and their account scripted? What is surprising and indirectly reassuring about the biblical gospel record is that the very first witnesses were women. Among first century Judeans, as throughout much of human history, sadly, the testimony of women was not well esteemed. It was discounted or doubted and held in less regard than the testimony of a man, and especially a man of standing and good reputation like the nobleman Joseph of Arimathea or the Pharisee Nicodemus. And this common understanding about first century witnesses and testimony actually lends credibility to the gospel accounts about the resurrection of Jesus. Because it was women who found his tomb empty. It was women who heard the announcement that he had risen. And it was Mary Magdalene who first met the risen Lord and recognized him as her resurrected master. No first century writer would have made this part of the story up. He would not have chosen women to be the first witnesses. He would have decided upon some trustworthy men. But the biblical gospels all recount that the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus were women because that is what actually happened. And what we should understand is truthful and reliable. Praise the Lord. But perhaps the reappearance of their master is what the women so fervently expected and so dearly desired that their own imaginations inspired them to believe in his resurrection. But this skepticism falls upon the plain and simple account about the discovery by the women. The biblical record readily admits that the followers of Jesus who first visited his tomb on Sunday morning were not expecting him to be alive or his body missing. Far from being expectant and excited to see their master risen and alive again, the women were mourning his death, preparing to honor his body, and wondering who would roll away the stone for them. When they arrived, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome were surprised and bewildered to find the large stone already rolled away from the tomb. Again, not what they were expecting, and not what they had predicted or planned, but just what they discovered. Neither did the women expect to find a young man in a shining white robe within the tomb of Jesus. And why does Mark recount that they found a young man? Why not explain he was an angel, like Matthew and John do. Because that is what the women first understood they saw. A young man, strangely dressed in bright white clothing, but seemingly and most likely to the women, a young man. They were not expecting to meet an angel in the empty tomb of Jesus. Mary Mary and Salome did not imagine a heavenly messenger with a marvelous announcement. 
because they first thought he was a strange young man sitting in the tomb cavern. At the sight of him, the women were alarmed because they supposed the young man was some officer of the Roman governor or the Jewish council. Was he waiting at the tomb to catch the disciples of the crucified teacher and punish them for following him? So again, the very first witnesses did not expect or imagine meeting an angel at the tomb of Jesus because their first reaction to him was alarm and fear. They never supposed he was a supernatural being. They thought quite naturally that he was there to arrest them. <clears throat> And what about the announcement from the brightly clothed man? What an astonishing revelation. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Why would some officer of the authorities report such a thing about a crucified criminal? Why would he dare declare that Jesus had risen from the dead? Why would he encourage the followers of Jesus to believe in the miracle of his resurrection? More likely, the man in the tomb was someone supernatural. His declaration about Jesus was what the master himself had prophesied would happen to him. This was not a warning from the executioners of Jesus, but a revelation from heaven about his resurrection. Alternatively and skeptically, if the empty tomb was the work of the Roman governor or the Jewish officials, why would they do such a thing? Why would they move the body of Jesus from the burial site? Why would they risk starting the rumor that he had risen from the dead? Why would the authorities inspire the very resurrection good news they would later try to suppress and dispel? The more reasonable explanation for the empty tomb of Jesus is the miraculous truth that he has risen. The resurrection of Jesus also makes better sense of the instructions of the young man to the women. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. These words remind the disciples of Jesus about his own personal assurance to them that he would meet them in Galilee. The instructions also acknowledge the failure of the disciple Peter and his need for forgiveness and reassurance from the Master. And most importantly, the words of the young man offer the disciples the hope of seeing their Savior and confirming his resurrection. If the man in the tomb was an only an officer of the governor or the religious council, why would he promise the disciples of Jesus that they would see their master again in Galilee? <clears throat> and why would an officer of the authorities offer forgiveness to Peter and resurrection hope for his disciples. And how would an officer and stranger know about the private conversations of Jesus with Peter about his betrayal and with the disciples about meeting him again in Galilee? The most likely explanation remains what the biblical gospels conclude and testify that the young man at the tomb of Jesus was really an angelic messenger. That he was at the gravesite to reveal for the disciples 
what had happened to their master and that the crucified Jesus of Nazareth had miraculously risen from the dead. <clears throat> and this revelation could not have been the invent invention of the women who came to visit the tomb of Jesus on Sunday morning after his death and who became the first witnesses of his resurrection. Because far from being inspired by the emptiness of the grave, they were terrified by the discovery and what it meant for them. Trembling and bewildered, the gospel text finally reads, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The women were at first afraid, afraid they might be arrested and prevented from reporting their strange discovery. But then the Savior himself appeared to the women and revealed his resurrection glory and heavenly mass majesty to them. Then they went and shared with the disciples of Jesus what the women had seen and what they then understood about their master. And then the very first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus would be silent no more. They would always testify forever who would, for whoever would hear the good news that Christ is risen. Praise the Lord. When I visited the Holy Land with a pastor's tour group in 2017, we went to the newly reopened Church of the Holy Sepulchre and even stepped inside the recently restored Edicule or Shrine House. It was exciting to stand in the place that had recently been confirmed as the site of the empty tomb of Jesus. But the same day, some of us also visited the alternative site for the grave of Jesus, which is known as the Garden Tomb. It lies just north of the old city of Jerusalem walls and not far from the Damascus Gate. Historians discount this site as the likely place of Jesus' burial because it receives no mention in the early Christian tradition about his tomb. But also because a distinguished Israeli archaeologist has dated the grave to the 7th century BC, or 700 years before Christ, long before the time of Jesus. But for many Christians, and myself included, the garden tomb has an appeal and offers much inspiration. Most remarkably, the site with its rough limestone rock and garden-like appearance seems to closely resemble what we read about in the biblical accounts. Now today, Christian groups visit the garden tomb site. They hold worship services there. They celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And you can watch the video recordings of their ministry gatherings on the internet. Even though the garden tomb is not the likely site for the burial place of Jesus, resurrection faith surely abounds there. And wherever the hearts of his believing followers gather. Because Christ the Lord is risen today. And he has revealed himself and his heavenly majesty to you and me and all who believe in him. Praise the Lord. Christ is risen. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful assurance. We thank you for this marvelous victory that you have uh, accomplished by your almighty power. 
that you have raised your Son and our Savior Christ Jesus from the dead. And we thank you for this, Lord, the glorious salvation that you have made for us through Christ's resurrection. We marvel at your grace. We wonder at your power, Father God. And we thank you that you have done this for us. You have raised Jesus from the dead so that we who belong to him by faith will also rise from the dead. We thank you that you have had such mercy upon us, such grace and love for us, Father God, that you mean to save us for all eternity and that we may live with you and our Savior Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, raising us from the dead and granting us eternal life. Father, we thank you for this, the greatest of all victories and the most wondrous of all salvation. And we pray that uh, you will fill our hearts with this assurance and that we will live always in the hope and the assurance of our own resurrection from the dead because we belong to our Savior Jesus. And so I pray in his matchless and merciful name, Amen. Amen. Send his son.